Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Chartrand. So I'm with the Trump Water Group based up in Cannes. So many of you haven't seen me before. There's a couple of familiar faces. Uh, we haven't had a seagrass talk, I don't think, with the sea, apart from John's introduction to some of the material with his talk. Uh, so hopefully I'll give you a little bit of an overall insight to start with of what our group does based in Cannes as part of Trump Water, uh, looking at seagrasses and helping to continue the information both for uh, the government side at the Grumpa level and also working uh, largely with ports and what we call habitats at risk. So a lot of the dredging and development, which is what a, a lot of our effort has been around. Uh, my focus for most of the talk is going to be on deep water seagrasses, which is a project I've been working on for just over four years now, um, trying to go into a very different, different area of um, seagrass research from previously. Can everybody hear me in can? Can you put your hand up? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, to start with, just to tell you a bit about the Seagrass Ecology Group. Um, originally, we were part of Fisheries Queensland, and this program has been run for over 30 years, led by Rob Coles, uh, and somewhat more recently, uh, Michael Rashid, running a lot of the ports programs. Um, the focus is really, as part of that, was with fisheries habitat, and that was the role of seagrass, and all of our research was really um, sort of focused around that. And that included um, some of the pioneering mapping that's happened within Queensland, not just within the Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area, but the larger, larger state, um, which started back in the 80s with Rob Coles and some of the early uh, leaders with that. Um, a lot of this advice has gone in for government decision making, um, as I said, for the ports and management um, for the coastlines and for permit approvals and whatnot. Um, we did move to JC at the end of 2012. Um, the, the Newman government decided it was time for a new home. We were a bit um, science and research oriented, and luckily uh, JCU and Tropwater uh, saw us as a, as a perfect fit. And I think it's been a really good move for us and the larger group um, to kind of delve into larger research questions as well as still having a great role working with government. Um, so just kind of summarizing some of the stuff that we've been working on, it's really about science-based solutions. So we're not coming from such a uh, pure science background, it's really um, application and seeing things implemented. So that's what our work has really been focused around, including the partnerships with industry, um, ports, and different uh, partners in government. Um, and this has included giving different mapping, monitoring tools, um, coming up with new ways to manage for fisheries habitat and seagrasses in general is the, the large focus. So, um, And with this, we really are trying to understand some of those key questions to develop is um, still understanding the science to feed into that. So the resilience of the seagrass systems and their ability to recover, uh, understanding how seagrasses disperse when there is loss, oh, ecosystem services. So a lot of those classic science questions, but making sure they have real world application and getting those answers out there. Um, just to delve into some of the specific research projects we've been involved with are listed there. There's plenty. Um, the two I've highlighted are the ones I've been uh, particularly interested in in the last uh, few years, which is establishing um, some idea of light requirements and thresholds for managing seagrasses. Um, more on the acute side, looking at port impact and looking at short-term um, pressures, and also coming up with potential sublethal tools to help manage that as well. Um, that's been uh, largely seen that we've had some pretty good success with these tools. Um, uh, a lot of you, especially John's familiar with our work in Gladstone, whether it's now part of the Healthy Harbor Partnership Report Card, um, that others in our group, Alex, have, have really led on implementing the monitoring and mapping and science into a system to understand what's the, the status and, and quality of the seagrass there. Um, also, the success that we had was sort of the light thresholds and really using those for compliance, which is really uh, a first for us, um, and I think first in Australia to have those as part of a government um, mandated um, part of managing dredging there. So that was um, a great tool. Uh, we've also done some more recent work working with uh, Gabrumpa as part of the NEST program and taking light thresholds, not just in the acute standpoint, but trying to look at it at the chronic level and concern over water quality across the larger GBR. Um, so we're starting to kind of work our way into this, working with others that are um, part of the Seagrass team, not just with our CANS, um, original CANS port-based work, but uh, Catherine Collier and others that have done a lot in this, in this environment working with Gabrumpa. Um, so, of course, as I've already kind of heard, um, the Great Barrier Reef is not just coral. I think that's important to highlight, and many of you are aware of this. 
But I think that message gets lost along the way quite often. Um, it's one of the largest seagrass ecosystems in the world with over 20% of the world's species um, within the reef system. And it ranges from a very wide range of habitat types. So that inner reef, reef platform, um, inner tidal, subtidal, um, those that are stable meadows, those that are ephemeral and come and go, uh, a large seasonal component to that. So there's a, a wide variety of seagrass types and systems and having the information uh, to be able to manage those appropriately is where we're really trying to move towards. And um, this is a nice little example of, of showing how ephemeral and how um, seasonal these meadows can be from February to September, so almost um, nearly absent to this lush thick meadow and how that plays a role for fisheries and um, sediment stabilization. Um, obviously, it's important. I think, again, if you know these things, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I just wanted to remind you of some of the important roles, apart from just for the iconic species as a food source, um, that sediment stabilization and um, feeding into the higher trophic level. So it's uh, feeding in at the primary productivity level of um, providing a food source for the larger system, as well as fisheries habitat for um, fish going out to the outer reef system at a, at a higher age. So with these, this information, we know that there's a lot of management questions they're always asking us. So where is the seagrass growing? An obvious one. So we do a lot of mapping and distribution of this um, to help um, feed in where um, permitting and, and dredging should happen or should not happen and other, other questions they might have, as well as where does it not grow, um, how much is there, what species. All of this information helps build a bigger picture. Um, but on top of that, we're trying to look into some of those um, deeper questions. So what are the real functional differences of the greater than 12 species of seagrasses that are found within the World Heritage Area? So that there's a wide, diverse, um, functional um, life history strategies that are used. So to be able to have a one-size-fits-all for all of these, especially when it comes to light and water quality concerns, I think that's um, where a lot of our work is going. And I guess with that, um, just to summarize, we've you know, talked lots about the different systems along the coast that have been studied. There's been a tremendous amount of work into reef, coastal, and estuarine systems, whether it be ports and embayments being a large part of that. Um, but very little has been focused around the deep water habitats. And despite the fact that um, Rob Coles and others back in um, the 90s were mapped greater than 30,000 square kilometers of seagrass occurring in these deeper uh, portions of the reef, that, that has to play a tremendous role. Um, and I think that's really the question um, that was put um, about five years ago when we started this project and trying to delve into that a bit deeper. Uh, we do know that they're, they're fast turnover, so they can turn over the entire meadow within a couple of days. Um, so that, oh, can you tell us what they want Oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't, that's a good point, thanks, John. Um, we're talking greater than 10 to 15 meters, there's no specific science to it, but generally 10 to 15 meters, and getting to who that really includes, um, we're talking about the Holophila. So these are relatively small in terms of their stature. Uh, we have the uh, Holophila decipiens, which is the most dominant throughout um, the GBR, as well as Holophila trichostata and Holophila spinulosa. So all fairly small, not your really large and hayless, some of those large strapulated species that you see making up some of those coastal meadows that you probably kind of typically think of when seagrass uh, comes to mind. So it's very small, so I think it tends to get overlooked in that regard. Um, but there's a lot we don't know about the system. How, how do those um, seasonal changes that we see in these seagrasses, what are they driven by? What are the key drivers? And are there species-specific differences? They're kind of grouped into these small holophilas that uh, dugongs or turtles might eat, but that's really, they come and go, it doesn't really matter. But I think there's a lot more to it than that without the science um, to be able to feed into it. Um, and so this program's really been starting to look at tolerance levels, um, whether, how are they <coughs> establishing after they're coming and going, what are their key germination cues um, after uh, typical seasonal declines that you do see. Um, of course, given our background, this program really was driven by a lot of the port developments happening up and down the coast, so fortuitous for the science. Um, this really uh, drove uh, Gabrumpa and uh, BMA as part of the Mackay Hay Point development to say, look, we need a program to really understand deep water seagrasses if we actually want to implement some sort of strategy to manage them during a dredging campaign. And I think it has wider implications, which go um, uh, uh, as well into the chronic and um, water quality management strategies, too. So um, these were the larger aims of the Deep Water Seagrass Project. These are the BMA and, as I said, Gabrumpa that were involved in funding this great project. 
Um, I'm just going to step through some of it, um, depending on how much time I have. Uh, but I'll start with some of the information we've started to gather and understanding those typical seasonal dynamics and, and trends that we're getting. Um, we did set up three deep water sites uh, back in 2012, uh, one at Green Island off Cairns, as well as up at Lizard, and one which is supposed to be a more typical port site off Mackay, which ended up having to be a little bit further offshore at Keswick Island. Um, with those, I'm just going to focus first on our Green Island site and, and show you some of the, the trend data that we've collected there. Um, so what you're seeing, it's a busy plot, uh, but just to start, so this is over time from 2012 uh, to the end of 2015. We have, this is above ground biomass of seagrass, and those are those green dots. So you're seeing these big peaks that you're getting from August to December and then fall off. This was a bit of a, a normal year across the board that we saw at some of our other sites as well in the program. Uh, and then you're also seeing, you know, the, the peaks that's somewhat um, expected that we're starting to see this in the, in the deep water system. So these real ephemeral growth, um, quick flourishing meadows that start in around July, August, and then quickly die off um, by December or January or so. Um, we also are getting some great information in terms of understanding the temperature. You're seeing that over here. Um, getting an idea about what their typical ranges that they're, they're experiencing at these depths, as well as the big squiggly line here, which is the light that we've been recording at this site with um, one small gap in, um, throughout that whole period. So that's what you're seeing over here on, on this other y-axis, total daily light. So it's really feeding in information in terms of what those trends are in terms of driving that seagrass change. Um, that just is highlighting those peaks. Uh, peak periods, and within that, we can start establishing some sort of windows of what is the lower light levels that they're getting when they're present, those that are sort of the higher at the highest threshold. So it's giving us a, a general picture of, of what they need. So somewhere between one mole and three to three and a half moles of light. So this was really important information um, that's helped us um, move on to some of the, the later stages of, of the project. Uh, this is our Lizard Island location. Um, this is made up of three species where I should have mentioned Green Island is um, pretty much solely Halophila discipiens. Um, this meadow a bit different. You do see, again, this trend in seagrass overall. I haven't broken this down by species, but you do see some differences as well. What would explain the trend variations in the uh, Between the two locations, sorry? Over, oh, over time? That's just your, your fluctuation in cloud cover, giving it depth. Yeah, so that's just the, I've, I've provided that, sorry, that black smoothing line is just to give you an indication of the overall trend. Just that out. Um, the other interesting thing at our Lizard Island location, you have the same um, information that's up there, um, but we had two major cyclones, as many of you are familiar with, um, both Category 4 that passed over, giving us a bit of an insight into the recovery rates of these meadows and how that's impacting on that trend as well, and some of the species-specific information of that. Um, I'm not going into that today, uh, it's a bit too much, but um, a, a bit of an insight that we wouldn't have had otherwise without this long-term um, monitoring site in place. So again, those peaks that you do see, while a bit different, you're seeing peaks again during that period. Um, you are getting grass persisting, can't quite see it here, throughout the whole year. So you are seeing differences between the Lizard Island and Green Island site, where Green Island is devoid of grass for a large portion of the year, whereas typically, apart from some short periods following Cyclone Nathan, um, when the, the grass is, is absent entirely. Um, again, we're getting an idea on potential light windows and what is um, required for these Halophila species. Our Keswick Island site is a bit of a shorter um, amount of information we have. It's only been started since 2014. Um, and this involves a different species, which we didn't have in the other two locations, which was our goal here. So looking at Halophila trichostata, again, overall, just similar kind of trends. So it's just to give you that kind of building a picture of what um, Halophilas and deepwater seagrasses are needing. And what we used this information for was really to, to go into the lab and look at some of these specific light and temperature thresholds that might be driving seagrasses, given those are sort of the two key primary drivers of seagrass presence and distribution, apart from other things such as nutrients. Um, but we wanted to look at that in terms of the role of acute light stress that you might get during a development such as dredging um, in the ports. Um, so going into that, we did bring um, some samples of our Halophila discipiens, which you see in this tub here. It's a very small bladed um, species. And then the Halophila spinulosa. So this has 
um, an apical marriage stem. So it actually grows a bit more upright with multiple um, single blades growing up that sort of vertical stem. So it's a bit larger in stature, but still relatively small compared, compared to your large bladed species. We did look at uh, two different factors. That was our light intensity and also the temperature. So we looked at what we thought was an ambient condition at the time of peak growing season, and that's the 26 degrees that you see up here, as well as what would be slightly more stressful or create some higher energy demand on the plant, and compared that with what um, we're calling a high light condition or ambient light conditions. So that's what was around that 3.2 moles of light per day, which appeared to be a healthy level for the seagrasses to, to grow and proliferate, comparing that with what's um, a low condition. So this is 25 micromoles um, per second, and that's around one mole a day. So we know that was really on the low end of whether um, and their growing conditions. Um, we also looked at a spectrally defined irradiance for this um, experiment, and which basically means we really wanted to adjust light to look like it does at depth. Um, you're not getting the reds um, once you've gotten past around 15 or 16 meters in these um, habitats. So we have specific uh, lights that we were able to plug in um, to be able to give um, seagrasses a bit more of a realistic condition that they're growing in. This is just showing you um, a, a picture of the percent of surface irradiance that you're getting at a typical deep water site. And that's this black squiggly line here. So you're seeing after about 600 uh, nanometers, you're not having any light reaching the bottom. Um, this is also a typical leaf, this gray shaded area, typical um, pigment absorption for the Holophila disappearance leaf. So it kind of just gives you an idea about what they, um, their pigments are and what um, wavelengths they do normally um, are exposed to. Oh, I should go back, sorry. With that, the, the metrics that we were focusing on, we looked at shoot density. Uh, we also looked at um, oxygen production and respiration, um, some photochemical efficiencies using a tool called a multicolor PAM, which I'll go into just briefly in a minute. Um, pigments, other optical properties of the plant to kind of look at, uh, at differences between these low light, high light, um, ambient temperature and more of a stressed higher temperature condition. Um, we did focus on below ground carbohydrates only for the larger Holophila spingulosa. Um, their below ground structures are so small, it was just impossible to, to collect and sample for. So we were only able to get data on the one species. In terms of the shoot density data results, we did see there was significant shoot loss. Um, this is from zero weeks to four weeks and shoot um, density. Um, you'll see the light colored symbols are the higher light, with the dark is the low light. While there was no temperature effect, we did see significant shoot loss in the Holophila discipient, so that was the smaller species, um, by only two weeks. So an incredibly fast um, response, which you would somewhat expect from a small species like this, but quite different from what some of the uh, measurements we were seeing in our more coastal um, strapulated seagrasses. Um, compared to Holophila spinulosa, shoot loss um, wasn't significant until four weeks, and we also saw even some significant shoot gain um, after only two weeks in the high ambient conditions. And again, no temperature effect. In terms of below ground carbohydrate, there was a significant um, difference in the soluble carbohydrates um, from this is time zero, that both of those highlight conditions where we saw increases in above ground shoots, we also saw significant increases in sol soluble carbohydrates, which is somewhat of an indication that um, there is extra storage going into the below ground. So that does appear to be sufficient um, for both producing new shoots and also putting away extra storage for potentially when times aren't so, aren't so good. I did mention the multicolor PAM. Uh, it's a little bit of a tricky instrument, so I don't want to go too far into this. But it's basically giving us a, some information on specific wavelength response to absorbing the light available to them. So it's breaking down um, the photosynthetic active radiation, or PAR, um, between that 400 to 700 range and looking at some specific wavelengths in there and comparing that to where the typical pigments that you would expect in the plant um, can absorb or potentially not absorb, where you have very low um, uh, concentrations of chlorophylls and accessory pigments. Um, so this was, again, trying to look at different species and, and comparing um, over that, um, those treatments. Um, so we're looking at both their ability to absorb light and also how efficient they were able to use that light and pass it down to potentially make sugars and produce um, storage compounds. 
So briefly, and I won't go too far into this again, um, this is looking at what we call sigma. So this is just their ab ability to absorb light at a specific wavelength. Um, these are all the different treatment effects, and I'm not going to go into the treatments um, so much. Uh, we're dealing with Holophily recipients here, and we ran it under just two conditions. But the, the bigger thing is to look at, um, and again with Holophily spinulosa, sorry, uh, same kind of trends overall. So you're seeing this high um, sigma or ability to absorb light at this 440 and 480 nanometers. So those are your more blue colors compared to um, when you look at those yellows um, and greens. So overall, there's a substantial difference, which you would expect based on their, their pigment profiles. Um, the importance of this really comes down to when you're dealing with a port environment and potential dredging, um, we do know that dredging can narrow the available spectra of light available to a plant. So you're getting a lot of scattering of particles, and you're getting more of these yellow wavelengths. Um, so the potential for that to impact on the plant is incredibly high. If you're only looking at the quantity of light coming in, that might actually be a misconstrued understanding of how those light conditions are impacting the plant if that quantity of light is really only coming in at a narrow band that isn't very um, uh, available when it comes to absorption and processing in the photosynthetic pathway. So this is important information that we're trying to understand across a number of species and as well part of the deep water program. So just to summarize what we know from all of this, um, we know that around one mole a day isn't enough um, for either species. Uh, we know temperature didn't have a major effect in terms of overall outcome for shoots. There was some effect on some of those um, photochemical efficiencies, but I'm not going to go into that today. Um, again, I didn't show this data, but pigments, there wasn't a real effect of pigments, which is a little bit surprising in terms of um, changing those concentrations based on light treatments over that period. Um, and as I said, a limited treatment effect. I'm not going to go into the wavelength specifics um, by treatment, though. Um, notably, the Holophila spinulosa does appear to have a capacity to draw upon the storage carbohydrates that it's been putting away. We've seen that in other coastal uh, species that we've been studying. Catherine Collier's done a lot of that work as well. And um, it's important to understand that might be a big difference compared to Holophila decipiens, which, while we weren't able to measure it, um, the fact that it has such small below ground rising structure in itself is an indication there's likely very little biomass for it to rely upon in um, times of poor light. This will really tell us that all Holophila that we've been grouping to now are not the same. Um, we, we kind of blanket give them uh, one uh, sort of life history strategy of coming and going quickly, um, but potentially there's um, differences in terms of how we should be managing for these seagrasses based on these sort of early findings. Um, I do want to come back to the original plot of the Green Island data, um, and I did say that maybe light's not the story, just because if you look at this um, period, of these, this peak growing period, you have them proliferating and then dying right off. Well, the light levels aren't exactly dropping off with that overall average that quickly. So we're seeing light levels maintained. Um, so we're going, well, maybe light's really not dry, driving that overall die-off. You know, the die-off is happening well before the wet season is setting in or any um, high plumes are coming out of the river system. So unlikely that that's driving that. Um, so what is driving it was really where we were going next. Um, and this really was uh, going into understanding the sexual reproduction of the plant. Um, we do know that halophilas do rely heavily on seed banks compared to the, the intertidal and, and shallower, their shallower counterparts, such as zostras. Um, but we don't know a lot about that. How much energy, energy allocation are they putting into those fruits? Um, how many seeds are they putting out? What's the density of that seed bank for them to recover from annually? So how important is that? And what are those key germination cues for those fruits um, to proliferate every year? those might have really important implications for management rather than the overall light threshold um, at the end of their, their life stage. Um, so going into that, that was kind of moving into the last, um, or sorry, not the last, the seed banks, and understanding their seasonality. Um, this is just a little snapshot of some of the data we've collected. So these plots are from Lizard Island and Green Island. Um, the gray is really showing you the above ground um, biomass of the plant, so the leaves, and comparing that with our seed cores that we're collecting at these sites. So this is density of seed that you're seeing changing over time. 
And that's really helping us understand how that's going to affect um, the overall outcome as we're going into that, that potential germination period of what the density is, how is that changing over time, and um, if you're having some buried in those deeper depths where they aren't potentially able to germinate. So we're just, again, building a bit of a, a better um, library of this information for the program. We also were looking at some of those key uh, germination cues. Uh, Halophilas are known to have light as a key germination cue. Um, given we're dealing with deep water, again, there's a spectral component that needed to be added into this. So uh, last year, we started looking at uh, the role of not only the intensity, but the quality of light and how that might drive germination. And again, the implication for um, things such as dredging that might change that quality of light. Um, so here you can see um, one of the seeds in the early, early signs of germination. It's starting to come out of the casing um, and some of the cool new leaf and, and root growth that we're seeing from some of the studies. I'm not going to show the data today because I think I'm going to run out of time, but I just wanted to introduce you to some of the, the programs that we're running. So again, looking at instead of all at that deep spectra, we're going to be comparing a more typical deep water spectra of light and how that might compare to a shallow water spectra of light in terms of germination success. Now, I guess going on to some of the last things of the project, um, I really wanted to mainly talk about number five, which is um, what we're calling program depth. So from some of these results, and I mentioned the grass seems to be dying off well before any of the environmental conditions are really deteriorating for these plants out there um, in the meadows. Um, so we're looking at this typical annual life cycle and whether there's um, sort of a programmed um, senescence that's going on and how that would have implications for management. Um, you can't expect them if you hold the light level at a certain level during a dredging campaign for the seagrass system to be maintained um, if they're naturally dying off anyway. Um, so this is a project that I'm currently collecting for. Um, we're basically looking at a snapshot over that um, seasonal cycle, so collecting the juvenile and early adult shoots um, and the transition into the, uh, the adult vegetative stage um, of the plant before you get um, a flowering and fruiting. So collecting at each of these time points really to look at gene regulation and going down into the transcriptome and looking for expression of certain cues and how that might change over the plant. Um, that together with hormones to understand really that functional role of uh, flowering and fruiting and how that might basically signal to the plant that it's time for senescence and, and die back. So that's, that's really where the project is going currently. Um, what does all of this mean? I think I've summarized most, most of this already. Light isn't everything, and despite the fact that some are familiar, that's what most of my focus has been over the last four years, I think it's important to look at the larger functional role of the plant in the habitat um, to be able to apply the correct science for management. Um, Again, the deep water, some species do have the capacity to rely on below ground storage reserves. Um, while otherwise, other ones such as the lawful recipients, I think do rely heavily on their seed banks um, to be able to um, flourish in the long term. So looking at potential management based on seed banks rather than light conditions, ensuring you're maintaining that seed bank for the, for the plant to um, reproduce the following um, and germinate the following year. Um, again, not created equal, so I think we've kind of summarized all of that. Um, I did just want to show you one final thing, which is some of the cool time-lapse photos that we took from our Lizard Island site. We did this sort of early on, trying to get a snapshot of the seagrass um, sort of daily over, we did this for a year or two, and, um, and uh, I'll just play the next video to show you. Hopefully it'll play, I might have to click. Um, this was over the February to March 2014 period, which was Cyclone um, Ida. Oops, I need that. So you can see it's kind of cool too. If you can look, there's some um, little leaf pairs. So how Halophila grows in pairs, the little shoots coming up along um, some of the rhizomes you can see in this corner. Um, and this is made itself its home with an occasional, <laughs> occasional sea cucumber coming in. So completely wiped out. <laughs> and yet since then, uh, the, the meadow has recovered 
uh, almost entirely based on the baseline condition. So, um, but with a with a difference in species composition. So we are seeing that uh, some of the the Halophila vallis, which um, isn't seen um, as prolifically as a deep water seagrass, you also get in a lot of shallow water habitats. It's much more um, uh, fluid and and able to acclimate to different conditions. Um, that species is not producing a lot of seeds in this in this environment, and it was taking quite a while to come back in. Whereas Halophila dissipiens, again, there's a seed bank there and there were still seeds in the system and we were seeing that within a month already coming back in so uh, and also differences between the cyclones we had we had a lot of information for both um, Nathan and I Ida and um, for one I think the first cyclone we had the site was completely buried under about a foot of sediment um, cyclone Ida it was completely scoured out so from one to the next in terms of the impact on the seed bank and how that that um, affects the overall meadow can be dramatically different. So it was kind of a nice little snapshot for us to, to see. So with that, I will say thank you um, for attending. And I, I just want to highlight a lot of the people. This is not just me. It's a, a very large project a lot of people have been involved with, both from the Trop Water Group as well as Peter Ralph and, and people down at University of Technology Sydney um, that are tied with all of the, a lot of the experimental and, and transcriptome genetics work that, that I'm doing for this. So thank you very much. Questions? So we might pass it to Cairns, but hang on, Cairns, I'll just turn your microphone up. That should work. Any questions there, Cairns? Can you speak up so we know that we can hear you? I don't think there's any questions here. Okay, great. Thank you. So, questions across the town hall. Anybody else other than John? Got a question? Um, yeah. Given flood River discharge mm -hmm. um, does two things to turbidity. Mm -hmm. um, Resuspension re in shallow water after the flood for the rest of the year um, in a place like Cleveland Bay, shallow water. But offshore, now we've got it. And in your, where you are, there's not much resuspension except in the site, of course. Um, and the impact will be more from Blooms, and they have very different light reduction in terms of wavelength than mineral sediment mm -hmm. in the water. So that's an interesting distinction, I think. But um, Definitely. I assume that phytoplankton blooms will come from very wavelength seagrass meat. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't present any of that today, but we are also um, from the long-term monitoring program. We've been collecting the spectral recordings. I showed one little example of it from a Green Island site. But we do have that for each location and looking at that seasonally and how that changes. And we are seeing differences that you would expect with Lizard Island being more that blue water where it's just sediment through suspension compared to even Green Island, which has a different signature in itself with a little bit more of an algal um, element to that. And so there's another impact there, uh, definitely. Uh, Mackay has been a bit tricky in terms of our site. Um, it's a very patchy habitat. So we originally, our, our first location, which I didn't show, um, the seagrass during the first three years of the program decided to disappear entirely. Um, we didn't have a really good data set. We decided it was finally time to give up and move. Um, and so we have much shorter, um, and it's a bit further offshore, so we're not getting the same port element to it in terms of the impacts um, locally. But it's feeding a little bit of information, and you can see a signal there with the spectrum, for sure. And it will be quite uh, time at the phytoplankton bloom, bloom is going to be there for two weeks. Yeah. Whereas the resuspension turbidity yeah. Yeah. comes and goes throughout the year. Right. In the shallow water, we get a resuspension by right. 15 metres probably, mm -hmm. not the south easterlies, but then it resuspends every time the wind blows. Right. Yeah. Right. Different, so that, that different pattern. Right. That key algal bloom period, you'd say, was after the, the flood, so you're getting a two-week period for that algal bloom that you're saying yeah, yeah. after, yeah. Whereas the resuspension, due to the delivery of that new fine material, mm -hmm. is a year long. Right. You read the Fabricius papers, you know, yeah. it's, it eventually winnows away from your stuff. But that's right. so you get extra turbidity for a year after there's been a big vertical discharge. Mm -hmm. I'm going through a lot of that spectral information now, so it's good to remind me of that, you know, because I think we're so focused on ports and impacts, and I'm trying to get more into looking at the chronic 
um, like water quality for any concerns for the reason. Thanks, Katie. Can I ask two questions? One is uh, blue carbon role. And the second one is this issue of offsets and whether people are being realistic when they talk about how much seagrass is there in Australia or somewhere else. Oh, that's so, a big question. Two simple questions. Um, I think it's it's definitely getting a, a lot of hype, as it should, because I think there's a lot of potential for storage. Deep water seagrasses, I think, um, from the little work, and I haven't been directly involved with a lot of the blue carbon uh, research, but colleagues that are part of the group have been doing that. Um, and we were feeling that, well, the, with the turnover rate, there's a potential on such a wide scale for even deep water seagrasses to have a huge role if you calculate it up despite their small size. Um, I think there's too much release going on, at least in that system, from what, I, what I'm familiar with the data from they did some work up at Lizard Island. It wasn't getting buried um, quickly enough, which doesn't entirely surprise me. Um, I think it's important to look at. I don't know that it really has as much weight as maybe it's being made out to be. Um, I'm not, I don't want to go too far into that. It's a pretty um, livid thing to say, especially given I know a lot of my colleagues are in Wales and that's a big topic for the whole conference is focused around blue carbon and seagrasses. So I think it has a, has a, a strong potential, but I think um, it's that don't everybody jump on the bandwagon too quickly and I think we really need to look at the science a little bit deeper. So that's all I can say at this point. I don't think I have enough um, knowledge on the blue carbon front to talk heavily about it. <laughs> and the issue of offsetting and you know, landing seagrass, people talk about the ability, if we've damaged it here, we can still land it there. Now, I think that has a little bit more um, value, potentially, in terms of um, understanding the capacity for restoration. And I think even our group, historically has been, oh, there's not really much of a need. The grass is always coming back. And if it wasn't there before, it's not meant to grow there. I think as we're moving forward, we're also recognizing that as things like the El Nino cycles and the impacts that we saw in the 2010, 2011 flooding periods or having big die offs, um, if those things are happening more frequently and not having that four to five years that it can take for a lot of these meadows to recover, that we do need to look at a way to potentially help that. And so I think there is a push now to say, let's look at um, what is needed and we have the capacity and the research to do that. So I think there is a, a, a relevant role for that at this point. I don't think um, so far GBRC grasses have, have um, been too hard off in that regard. I don't think we've needed to do some major restoration, um, but I think understanding, you know, when it comes to that, which given the increased frequency of these events, um, it's going to be needed. If the seed banks have been scoured out, um, there's no ability for a lot of these places. Dispersal, um, some of those questions that we're looking at, that some of these areas aren't going to get seagrasses feeding back in very easily, so we need to understand how to potentially restore. Yeah. I was wondering if you have a seed Pygmy squid. Any pygmy squid, say? Um, I see some at our, uh, you know, at our Green Island site. We do see a little bit there. I haven't um, at the Lizard Island location personally, um, but other other people have. We haven't focused too much on on the role of other you know, the invertebrate community too much at this point, and other the fisheries role in the deep water habitat. Although I think it's really important too, because I think it's another overlooked element to the larger fisheries question. Um, oh, I can't say. I, I'd say somewhat. Uh, we've seen them over the winter period. I saw some, but I don't. I don't know. It's a bit of a side thing off the top of my head. I couldn't tell you. Okay. <laughs> John. Given some of these look like they're recovering by sea. Mm -hmm. What's the sort of distance of say dispersal? It's, we got some right. Answers um, on that. I don't think we have definitive answers. I think it's understood it's only supposed to be fairly small dispersal from the plant itself within you know five to ten square meters away. You know the relative <laughs> area. Even that. How long the seeds? The, the seeds don't cut off. They tend to fall out into oh, the right sediment. Down. We do see a lot of bioturbation, so that's the other thing. Looking at didn't go into it with the, the stratification. We're looking at stratification of seeds into the different fractions and depth. So looking at the surface to deeper, and we're seeing actually quite um, high density in some of those deeper um, portions, which you see big mounding. I don't think I, I, I can see right there. Um, the mounding that you see at our sites, the calium acids doing that. And so I think there's a lot of turnover, and you often get where the seagrasses first germinate from these big star-shaped patterns of rhizomes growing out from on top of those. So my guess is you're getting this turnover that right time of year 
the light conditions and they're coming to the surface and germinating. So I think it has an important role, the bioturbation that's happening. Um, we see that at Green Island. We definitely see that at our Lizard Island site. Uh, historically in the literature, it's always been considered a negative feedback in terms of calium acids on seagrasses, but I think this is a great example where it's probably important for their um, seed turnover in the sediment. So, so that must mean for a, a big cyclone like us, mm. compared to these narrow band ones like Nathan and that, uh -huh. it destroys the potential seed bank. So it might destroy them, but I just... a wide area or it makes it unlikely that you'll get I, I don't think we have enough information on that, but I think, if anything, it also can be a positive in terms of dispersal of seeds. I do think there's likely that you would also then see a wider dispersal from <coughs> one-off um, storm events like that in terms of cyclones. So there is the potential for it to then help redistribute seeds. Um, I know Samantha, who's um, also based in Kansas, looking into uh, the role of mega herbivores in terms of dispersal as well, feeding in these systems and redistributing seeds. So I think her work is going to be really interesting, and she's done some stuff already with some of the coastal species. So. The, uh, some of them do. She'd be able to talk better to that than I will. Um, hopefully she'll give a talk down the track, so you can hear about that one. Yeah, but I think some of them do. So in those cyclones here, that when the cyclone that scowled obviously could redistribute the seeds to a wider area wherever that sediment or That's seeds right. went to. Mm -hmm. The ones that where the burial occurred by people, will that mm -hmm. is it then rely on the bioturbation to bring those seeds back up to the surface for them to regerminate or, or are they virtually become I would assume so. That's another element to the program that we haven't really had, you know, the funding to go into. I'm really um, curious about the role of the bioturbation. I think there's some sort of um, indicators that it's playing an important role, but um, any data we haven't been collecting on that thus far. So, but I'm, I would imagine there is also some redistribution of that sediment over time following the cyclone. Um, but I think the calcium acids would play a really important role. Do all accidentally? <laughs> not that I'm aware of. I haven't heard of that, but yeah, not, not that I, I've seen or heard. So they carry a little while like, hmm. I wouldn't yeah, have thought that okay. particularly. Might be a bit large. <coughs> that, that, that is if it was there. Sure. Yeah, they probably heard. I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, you know, there's plenty of Haltharians around our, our okay. sites. I'm not seeing them feeding through any of the grass. If anything, they're more in the bare, bare sediment parts around the meadow. So. Now, just well, just keep in mind that with the camps, guys, is there any but questions that have come up up there? Oh no, no, no. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I think we still have a bit of time. The sushi still hasn't arrived yet, so you know, stick around for a free feed. I imagine it's turning up at some stage. So. I think she said the room is booked after, so it might be outside. Oh because of that, sorry. Right. Yeah. I, I just a bit curious that the uh, temperature wasn't that cool factor. Mm. Why not be and also even the cold which is the sequence. I think what ended what before possibly probably probably <laughs> I, I think seagrasses in general have a, a pretty high temperature tolerance. Um, you definitely, in the coastal intertidal habitat, you get burning at the leaves. You can see even burning off. Um, but those are in extreme circumstances with cooling water above 40 degrees. So seagrasses in general have the capacity to withstand that. I think with um, looking at light and, and the overall carbon budget of the plant, we definitely see where we have low light conditions in ports and high temperatures. I think that's really an important thing to, to build into it. Deep water seagrasses, I don't, I just think 30 is really nothing. It's going to increase some energy demand, um, but because we weren't really seeing a change in the light, as I was saying, towards the end of that season, while temperatures are going up, um, if I zoom in on that, that record, there's no real indication that that's what's happening at all. So I think they can withstand it. It's obviously driving a little bit higher respiration naturally in the plant, um, but not anything extreme. And I, I stuck within temperatures that were reasonable. I mean, deep water, you're not going to be getting... Um, higher than around 30, 31. And given the fact that the grass also is naturally dying back well, truly before you're getting those peak temperatures, it's all about the seeds. They're already in the seed bank for the following year. So we didn't see anything across the board. I know there was wider questions about coastal seagrass up, up in the northern section. Uh, from my understanding, there was no real bleaching of the, because you can also get bleaching of the leaves. Um, I don't believe even in the subtidal habitats there, there was any observed. Um, yeah. How did you actually regulate 
I didn't manipulate temperature. I pretty much stuck at a, it was just using heaters. So we stuck with around 30. I think our deep water, there's not a huge fluctuation in that deep water habitat that you also would get with shallow between day and night as well. So it makes things a little bit easier in that regard. How important factor is uh, ultralight and infralight in your craft has uh, visible lights? So what happens when we are outside of visible light? I'm sorry, outside of? Uh, visible light. Then we have ultralight or UV. Infra yeah. Then, so in terms of depth, I didn't really look at that. So for those lights given, um, I didn't really focus on UVs with those. They don't build into that. But it, it is a good question in terms of what role those might be playing. I do know with germination, that was something I was interested in, I didn't go into about the difference between a shallow water structure and um, the deep water where you're not having those reds and potential infrareds, where you do see typical hormone signaling that you can get from that far red light signal. So to me, I think there could be something important there and at a genetic level, whether these plants have adapted to not um, needing that. Um, normally with a light germination cue, you have to have some of those far red cues, which that wouldn't be um, happening in this, this circumstance. So um, I don't know about the UV. It's a good question. It's something else to explore, but we did in this part, part of this project. The lights did, I should imagine, kind of tied with the temperature. We did try and put the ramp up so you can program to be more natural daylight so it's not just on off kind of the old style. It's a, it's a natural um, daylight cycle. So. Any new analysis of the importance of this to do bombs and green turtles? Not at this stage. It's not been part okay. of this project. No. So what, what's the current understanding? Do, is, in do, terms do of you say do preferring Holophilus, they're saying, oh, I think, from my understanding, and I think, again, Samantha will be better to answer this, but I think um, it's sort of been dispelled from Helene's work that there's a preference for Holophilus. I think um, you actually do also see trimming and um, munching on some of those more fibrous species. So I, my understanding that that sort of old paradigm doesn't hold anymore from their guts, from their gut contact um, studies. Just a pretty thin result. So, yeah. It is. I think, you know, especially when... Um, and I don't know that there's data to back it up, but I think the idea was that during the flooding and, and, and um, die off of those coastal areas that the potential for um, dugongs to dive deeper and potentially rely on some of these deeper water areas um, is there. I don't know how much planes, but I haven't seen her work on that. Um, but, um, all three have, have sort of variations in the environment. Uh -huh. But did you find any thing in the studies that you were surprising this um, I think Surprising or not surprising. I think um, that the it's it's interesting that the Halophila recipients did follow that trend despite the difference in the spectral quality between this more blue water lizard island conditions and the green island, which has, as John pointed out, a very different spectral kind of background environment that it's ex, um, exposed to. So it did follow that same trend. So you get that die off cycle the same despite the light level. So that's where I think. Um, we definitely went left field with the project going into the genetic and the program death work, which could be, you know, kind of a completely um, different finding that I was expecting at the end of the project. So um, that was probably one of the most fascinating things. I also think um, we've been able to dispel one of the Holophila species. I think in my um, abstract I put in that there's 15 plus species, and I corrected that for my slide. I, I, I definitely believe there's one um, less than, than properly described, and we've yet to be able to publish that. But um, there's another species called Holophila capricorni that um, has to do with its pretty minor distinctions between these small Holophilas, but either they have hairs or don't have hairs on one side of the leaf. And um, I, we basically uh, have found that it's not a lack of hairs. It's a difference between where they're growing, which has to do with close to the reef, back reef areas, compared to the more inshore turbid habitats, where you get a really sort of hairy leaf in those turbid environments. And that's kind of a really cool question uh, we're trying to look into with colleagues in Sydney and microsensors to look at the, the effect of that on oxygen flow, um, whether it's the light conditions that's helping enhance, sort of like a coral skeleton in terms of enhancing optical um, qualities for the leaf, um, the scattering through the leaf hairs, or if it has something more to do with nutrients and the difference. So there's a few questions there that that has been a cool surprising thing. Um, we're still kind of going forward with that, so that's been a good one. So the place on the Sadar was interesting. 
you're already in the tidal jet upwelling system there, and that's why we've got calometers there. Remember? Yeah, yeah. And down deep. And so that's an extra nutrient source they'll be getting there. And if there's any problem with nutrient limitation mm. in some places up there where you've got those tidal jet up or call up or there's sort of form up or they're not right. true from deep water, mm -hmm. up or but they're shallow up or and you're still getting a bit of nutrient supply, and that's why mm -hmm. they were there. Right. I don't really see a difference in terms of the, the habitat, um, difference in the seagrasses anyway, between that. I think someone else mentioned something about that same up when you're getting in the north. Keswick versus listen to that. Yeah. Keswick, there's no mm. type of jet. Right, know. right. So, yeah, interesting though. Definitely some of these other elements to, to really look at. There's some good data sets I think as part of ELS and others um, to look at some of these those parameters. So, yeah, so to be continued, it's, it's, the project's not done yet, so I'm now at the analysis stage. There's a lot there. <laughs> All right, I think we'd better wind it up there, given that there'll be mm. people coming into the room oh, yeah. soon. But <clears throat> there is the sushi, it's just been left outside for us, so feel free to stick around and have some sushi and ask Katie some Thanks. extra questions. Um, please thank Katie for a, a great presentation. I think it really demonstrates... <laughs> based up in care. So a lot of exciting work going on and thanks for sharing it with us today and coming to town talk. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, thanks for that. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. 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 ye